Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome to the future of global value chain session. Um, to start, I would like to just uh, get you into the reflection mode. Why do we put future in the title of the session? Is it because we are in the middle of multiple disruptions happening at the same time, which may require a new way of dealing with change? These disruptions include geopolitical and deglobalization pressures, technology and AI, supply chain disruptions, customer expectations, sustainability and climate drivers, demographic changes, and shifts in value propositions and business models. These disruptions are all typically found at the intersection of key ecosystem players like suppliers, distributors, channels, customers, and also countries and governments. Is this an inflection point or an accelerated shift? That's why I am excited about this uh, panel. Uh, one of the main pillars of the center is global value chains. And we are very, very fortunate to have such a distinguished set of panelists representing a variety of industries. I'm gonna briefly introduce them and then I'll sit down and start getting them, let them talk. Uh, so let me start with uh, Jen Morgan. Jennifer is uh, the global head of portfolio operations at Blackstone with the intent to leverage Blackstone's capabilities and scale to benefit portfolio companies across industries. Before joining Blackstone, Jennifer served as the co-CEO of at SAP, the first female CEO of a DAX company. Then we have uh, Amr Batiki. Amr is a senior vice president of platforms at Jacobs and has the digital business unit. He and Jacobs have tremendous experience with engineering, construction, infrastructure, and sustainable technologies in intersecting value chains. And then we have Andres Gluski. Andres is the CEO of the AES Corporation one of the world's leading renewables and clean technology companies. In recent years, AES has signed more contracts with corporations for renewable energy than anyone else on the globe. And it has been widely recognized for innovation, sustainability, and ethical standards. So please join me in welcoming the panelists. We are like very lucky to have them here. So we have a limited time for such a fascinating topic. I'm a little bit biased. Supply chains and global value chains is uh, the core of what I do, the main theme of my academic and consulting work. So like, to start off, each of you leads a world scale operating platform with visibility to worldwide economic supply chain and inflation dynamics. Tell the audience what you are seeing in your companies from this standpoint in real time on the ground right now. What are you guys seeing? Want to start? Please do. Okay. Uh, well, we, we've lived through a time of major disruptions. So first it really was COVID. And when you really had China locked down and you had the um, shipping rates go up by a factor of six, I think that the world sort of learned the perils of having sort of one source for key supplies. So um, what has happened, it's kind of interesting, now that COVID's passed in, in the sense of you know, major supply disruptions, uh, you really have sort of uh, economic nationalism. Mm. And so really you have a delinking in many respects of the, of the US and China, which I think may be occurring faster than it, than it should in some sense. Uh, you also have uh, technological changes in the sense that um, it's not much reported in the press, but there's an enormous amount of nearshoring and actually onshoring of industry into the US. But uh, a lot of that is going to be very high tech manufacturing. Uh -huh. So um, what I would say is, you know, some should have been obvious things of, you know, sort of the world was too dependent on single source, mainly China. So there's been a move away from that. The world has been uh, uh, disrupted, I would say, by the political uh, mood between the US and China. And it's not only the US, Europe's following a similar route of trying to onshore a lot of, a lot of things. So we're in, we're in the midst of this enormous change, and I would layer on top of that uh, 
corporate and government mandates to go towards um, a low carbon economy. Mm. So you have a lot of things happening at once. Um, and unfortunately, the, the debate and the way this is being presented uh, to the mass audience is usually wrong in, in many respects. So oh. it's, um, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to get a sort of rational debate and it's difficult to get a rational debate from, from uh, I would say, elected officials. You know, some of it, you know, to the other extreme on the left is like, why don't you just stop all fossil fuels today? You know, clean energy can do it. And the truth is, there's going to be a transition. It's going to take 10, 20 years at least. Uh, and on the right, you have a complete denial of... Um, climate change itself, which is the greatest challenge of our times, and also, quite frankly, a denial of the economics of clean energy, which produces, right, today, in most cases, it's, it is the cheapest energy. It just isn't around the clock, it's intermittent. Mm -hmm. So that's the big problems that we're facing. And lastly, um, if I look at the growth rates that everybody is projecting, again, taking clean energy, which is my area, there just isn't enough stuff in the world there isn't enough copper. It takes seven years to bring on a new copper mine. There isn't enough lithium. There isn't enough production of rare earths. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to have to invent a lot of new materials and a lot of new technology, which is in the works. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I say, the true story. And so you're kind of balancing this, like climate deniers, climate absolutists. And um, quite frankly, I say in the West, um, a discussion that's basically saying geopolitics is more important than climate change. Mm. And, and that's, you know, uh, not totally coherent with what we're saying. I like the term you introduced, economic nationalism. That is kind of an interesting, you are also talking about the gap in what is uh, the people get to read and what is actually happening. So I hope that at some point, and, and uh, the tone is a little bit pessimistic. So at some point, you know, this is university, this is the yeah. future of the world. So, you know, uh, if, no. you, if you start putting them down now, you know, first I'm about to start crying, but, but let, let's, oh, it, it will be good if, you know, now that he started with such a low tone, can you lift the spirit Oh my here? gosh, that's a lot. So, I mean, so far I'm Yeah, so I'm going to go down, then go up. So, yeah, but, but down slowly. Little. Yeah. yeah. So, so we focus on critical infrastructure and advanced manufacturing. Uh, we're seeing a lot more focus on resilience and cost pressures as a result of the inflation and increase in interest. So we're seeing our clients really hone in on how can I do things more efficiently, more cost efficient. Uh, but at the same time, there are a couple of trends that you mentioned that are actually positive. Uh -huh. So technology and data and AI are helping us really find solutions to address those challenges Good. and make sure we find ways to uh, amplify the amount of money that the cap you spend in capital in delivering more capacity than usual in the infrastructure world. Mm -hmm. And then also on another front, we see also decarbonization as a positive trend. We see our clients really focused in on, on the full life cycle of their okay. assets mm -hmm. and try and identify mm -hmm. ways to better justify the decarbonization in the sense of a triple bottom line activity. Thank you. I mean, I think that the word you use, we teach a lot about that word, which is the resilience. It's like the new mandate to be resilient. I mean, no, not many people understand the word, but it sounds very good, mm. like we need to be resilient. So it's good. And actually what I take, which is very important, and I agree with that, is the full life cycle. Like, you know, the planning horizons are changed in our field relative to the previous uh, panel. Ours is like, you know, we do things and that doesn't change overnight. It's not like money moving in, the investment in infrastructure and all that takes a long time. Jen, all positive, I know. All positive, right. Um, so we have a Blackstone, uh, almost like a, a mini economy of companies. We have around, call it 240 or so companies. And so we can see a lot across a lot of different industries, healthcare, technology, industrial services all over the world. And so in Q2, what we saw is our companies, our larger companies growing at about 12% their revenue and their EBITDA as well, which it's kind of goes contrary to everything that we hear on the news. Now, when you dig into that, um, volumes, right? So the volumes of things being sold or services, mm -hmm. the, 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 the units were down, the pricing was up. Okay. So these businesses were able to use, you know, the, hopefully you're running a quality business, which we invest in quality businesses, 
that gives you a little bit better pricing power. Mm -hmm. So these companies raise their prices and therefore the revenue, um, the revenue was increased. Now, the question, and Kevin alluded to this earlier about that certainty in prices and where does that go? I think really the debate is like, will companies be, who do have pricing power be able to continue that you know, further and for how long? Mm -hmm. So that's what we saw as it relates to kind of the companies and growth in, in the second quarter. We also spend, obviously we look at numbers a lot. We see a lot of numbers, but we also talk to the leaders of these companies a lot. So every quarter we spend time with our CEOs, our heads of supply chain, our CFOs, and sentiment tells you a lot of not just what's happening, but why is it happening, uh -huh. right? So we saw a couple of things. With inflation, what we saw at the end of Q2, inflation coming down, you know, close to the 2%-ish or so, what we were seeing now in commodities. I'll come back to labor in a second. Mm -hmm. So inflation definitely moderating. Um, as it relates to supply chain, same thing. Um, you know, obviously you touched on, um, you know, on, on that and that, that the supply chain is definitely uh, not as tight as it once was with shipping rates, containers, et cetera. Almost 100% of our supply chain leaders felt neutral to positive for the future. So I think that you've seen, you know, definitely improve and, and companies have seen that. Now, as it relates to labor, that's where you see a little bit more, you know, of the inflation. I'd say that's an area when we ask our leaders, where do you not see it, you know, moderating as much? Labor is probably that area, still, okay. you know, good employment. Um, now is a time of season where many companies are doing their annual planning for next mm -hmm. year and thinking about things like, you know, what are, what, you know, the costs and raises for people and that kind of thing. So what we're seeing is that in general, hiring is kind of flattening. Um, vacancy rates, which means, you know, how long are these positions open for? At one time, they were open for a long time, you know, mm -hmm. about a year and a half ago. Those have also kind of moderated um, as well as attrition. So that's what we see in terms of kind of inflation, um, supply chain, and attrition um, in our economy right now. That's great. Um, I would like to uh, touch on something was mentioned before. We have been talking a lot about onshoring, nearshoring. I mean, all that has been like a, suddenly supply chain became like everybody knows what it is. A few years ago, it was like nobody was into that. Offshoring was extremely important for a long time. Like offshoring was like the magic solution. You go and then you go to Asia and go to all these places. Now suddenly all the conversation is shifting into offshoring is not as good and actually is almost bad. And then we're talking about nearshoring or even French shoring. But those decisions do not happen overnight. I mean, it's not like transferring money from one place to the other, from one bank to another. So how are you guys dealing with all this offshoring, nearshoring, French shoring, all that uh, debate? How is that affecting you? Sure, and I'll, I'll continue in the negative vein. But I <laughs> yeah, started, yeah, that's so, okay. So I'm an economist. No, I'm actually very optimistic that we'll be able to overcome these things. But I do think it's important to point out you know, what are the hurdles? So, you know, being very frank, um, the West um, really um, outsourced pollution in many industries. So a lot of the things you read about, well, China has 95% of uh, polysilicon processing or lithium processing. That's because they're very polluted. They have no secret, you know, technology that we could do it, rare earths. Rare earths aren't really that rare. It's just, again, the United States started doing it then we decided, well, let's actually let them do some of this dirty work. So um, having said that, uh, what we've been, a lot of us have been doing for a long time mm -hmm. is, yeah, being very aware, look, we're very dependent on China for certain components of the supply chain. So first, it, it takes, as you say, it takes a lot of time to move the whole supply chain. So it's actually easier to move, for example, the final assembly than it is the supply chain itself. So, Take something like solar panels, which have been very much in the news. I say about five years ago, uh, we started sourcing our solar panels from Southeast Asia, just like Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, mm -hmm. to get it off China. But they still had certain critical minerals that were coming from China. Uh, I think that um, you know what's happening. You know, give me the case right now in the states, you have several laws that restrict the importation of. Uh, Chinese solar panels, some very justified, like the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, that you really have to check it. But quite frankly, the Europeans don't follow that. 
So today, a, a solar panel landed in the States can cost twice as much as anywhere else wow. because of these restrictions. Then we have the IRA, which on the other hand gives you certain subsidies which offset this. But thinking about the future, I mean, first, we really should have like a carbon tax. You know, what energy are they using to produce these raw materials abroad? Is it like, you know, coal plants in China? Then you have to think about the transportation, and then you have to think about bringing it onshore. So if you actually included the cost of carbon on all this, mm -hmm. then sourcing things closer becomes more attractive. Then you get the fact that you should source it from places you don't think are going to have political disruptions or, you know, or politics is going to. Um, and lastly, I think that, you know, what we really have to do is, is or we are doing, quite frankly, is modern manufacturing is much less labor intensive. And that's not, you know, the U.S. is manufacturing more than ever. You'd never know that from what you're reading in the press. And we're seeing tremendous amounts of, you know, EV factories, battery factories being put in the States. Mm -hmm. um, I think what the U.S. has had a hard time, and it's not just current administration, it goes back like two, three administrations, is that we tend to look at the trade disputes like as tax, as, our, as a sort of really um, uh, trade attorneys. And you, know, you, you defend one client, one product. And I'll, I'll give you a case. About six years ago, we were about to be the anchor tenant for a new factory of solar panel assembly in the US. We're just about to ink this. And then they put a tariff on aluminum. So actually, it was still cheaper to bring it in from China and pay the tariff on aluminum. Oh, wow. So you don't have people thinking about the whole supply chain yes, yes. or thinking about the timing. Like, we'll put, you know, tariff on the final stages and then move up the supply chain. Because, you know, the states and the Western Hemisphere pretty much can produce anything. Mm -hmm. But you have to have certainty, like to open mines, open up smelters, et cetera. So I'm optimistic that uh, I, I see tremendous movement in that direction. But I do see a mismatch between the way tariffs are applied, that they cause interruptions. Uh, sometimes policymakers write laws that they're, they're requiring perfection immediately. Mm -hmm. and, and that, quite frankly, then you don't even start this process of moving the whole supply chain because it's like the solar panels. Well, if you're going to tax imports of aluminum, then it's still cheaper to import it. So you, right. we need people who understand supply chains thinking about the laws that they're implementing. No, that's uh, fascinating what you're saying. Now, when you talk about the carbon tax, I yeah. mean, the carbon tax is not something that might directly affect the efficiency of the process is something that is for the environment and all those things so my question we will get mm -hmm. into that before we you know after mm -hmm. we hear the other points is that to what extent you need a shift in the thinking at organizations that you know they need to move from purely financial return and get into enlarging the definition uh -huh. for you know stakeholders rather than shareholders well you know you're you're um purchasing managers usually not a fuzzy, warm type of person, right? <laughs> so, you know, you need to put numbers on it. And you need to say, this is the price of, of carbon. Uh -huh. And then they can work with it, honestly. You're gonna say like, you feel good, don't feel good, no. This is the price of carbon, price it into what you're sourcing. Uh, eventually, I think, you know, we could actually do quite a lot. You know, Europe's coming in with a carbon border tax, sort of like a, a VAT tax, uh, but for carbon. And that's really what counts to, to, to if we, we have to be clear, the goal is to reduce the rate at which the climate is warming. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you do need comprehensive, this is global warming. You know, we could all drive, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, Teslas and buy renewable energy, have solar panels. And if you don't uh, make that technology available or, or involve the rest of the world, you know, China, India, Africa, we're not going to win this battle. So, so that's, I, I think, is very important. We have the technology to do this, right. but I don't think we have the understanding um, uh, to do it, nor is there really an effort to educate the population yes. and voters uh, about these issues. So, you know, you feel bad about the climate, then you go to one extreme, mm -hmm. and then on the other side, you know, complete denialism. Um, and the, the problem is the vast majority in the center, it doesn't make enough noise. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these things are, I think are technical, but they're not that really difficult to, to explain. Oh, that's good. That's good news. You see, you're shifting into I'm being slowly. positive. <laughs> I mean, it took like only 20 minutes to warm you up, but now you're coming along. That's good. Dan, for you? 
Let you me know, I, Reynolds. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a complicated operating environment, right? It's so complicated if you think, if you rewind the clock back, you know, a few years, everything was, gro you know, all growth all the time, you know, mm -hmm. it was so positive. Right. And so many leaders in positions today haven't led through cycles, right? And there's just, there's so much more happening outside the four walls of a company than inside, right? And so you can't make knee-jerk reactions. Things mm -hmm. take longer. Um, and I think this is why you need, um, you need a lot of different, you know, when you talk about kind of a diversity of a leadership team, mm -hmm. think of everything that we just talked about here, right? You need a lot of different experiences yes. to be able to resolve these issues because you can't, while you're running a business day to day, say, I'm going to move my supply chain over here. It doesn't work like that. Right. Right. So I think a lot of the conversations are um, not, okay, either or, but and. Correct. Right. Um, we definitely see that in our portfolio. Um, but yeah. It's, uh, it's complicated. Great. No, I appreciate that. I have to tell you that after being here for so long, I can tell that the students embrace that. Mm -hmm. They embrace not the either or, but the and. Yes. It's a very interesting part of their thinking. So that's, we are getting aligned with the way they think. Yeah, so, so we, we, we definitely see a lot more interest by our clients to understand the source of origin of their supply chain. Uh -huh. and, yes. and the good news is with generative AI with data analytics, we now have abilities to make that supply chain much more visible and viewed by our clients. And as a result, A, push things like resilience, you mentioned that. Right. What we mean by that is understanding how their supply chain is affected by geopolitical conditions, uh, supply, supply and demand pressures. Now they can get that visibility through the digital footprint of their supply chain. Mm -hmm. And then also in addition to that, now they can actually start visualizing their mm -hmm. carbon footprint properly as a result yeah. Yeah. And, and start thinking about how you um, uh, put on and embrace certain carbon taxes. You couldn't if you couldn't really audit, track, make sure you understand how the supply chain is affected. So, so technology is really affecting the, the ability to do certain things we couldn't 12 months ago. The, the other thing that from a professional service perspective we, we look at the globe as the workforce mm -hmm. supplier for all of all, all our team members. So each project can have 40 offices delivered from all across the globe when the client allows us to deliver that way. There are some clients that are saying we need either onshore or maybe near shore, but no offshore. Okay. But some are, are really pushing, uh, allowing us to do to the supply through anywhere, anywhere in the world. And as a result, we plan our global resource footprint in a way that we believe can serve the whole uh, globe mm -hmm. and provide resources for anybody in the world. That creates also from a value chain, a resilience element in the, uh, to our clients. I like you know, the use of the word resilience because it has been in our conversation for a long time. Now, when we go back to the premise of offshoring, uh, volume was the key word of offshoring. Why did China gain you know, such an incredible market share? Because with volume, they were able to lower price significantly, low labor costs, I mean, all that. But then there was a trade-off between uh, economies of scale and time, speed at which you get things happening. How are you, can you give us examples of how are you dealing with this? You know, now is, a, is an important trade-off because uh, yes, it would, they were able to lower the, the costs so much that you were given to sacrifice with volume, you know, the, but now with resilience and all these things, how are you managing the trade-off volume versus speed? Well, I think it was always a, a matter of sort of risk management. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, you know, because, yeah, it, it depends, but take something again, my area sort of build, building renewable projects. Uh, getting the materials there on time is extremely important mm -hmm. because you have to meet an obligation by a certain date. So there always was this trade-off between, you know, the cheapest uh, and getting it there. So I think that what do I think the future is going to be? Uh, I think in the future, you know, we had like just in time, you know, where people would manufacture, but you'd have the whole shipping uh, and supply route. Um, with things like 3D printing, things like more robotic factories, labor cost isn't the most important. Okay. So you can actually have a much better just in time by having it very close. And logistics become mm -hmm. extraordinarily important. Um, but again, I really think that the big disruptions we're going to have is that we really have to have new materials. Uh, we have to have smarter systems. 
-hmm. you know, using, uh, you know, AI, using, using much better data models. But we really, you know, I I'm talking about things like superconductivity. I'm talking about uh, things like using perovskite and, and thin film for solar panels. So the ironic thing is that a lot of the discussion today is like last year, last war. You know, China may end up with a tremendous amount of installed capacity for things that are obsolete. So, so China, in a, in a sense, has really subsidized a lot of things. You know, solar became so much cheaper because the Chinese overbuilt their factories. Uh, uh -huh. that, that's the truth, much more than technological improvements in solar. Um, so they have really subsidized a lot of our advances in renewables. Now, it's not but, real. Yeah. I think that the future, the future is going to be much more uh, technologically advanced. There you really go. things which are, which are more, uh, more efficient from a physics point of view. Mm -hmm. No, but I, I seriously think that is very optimistic, like, you know, in the sense that by bringing it here, all the traditional premises like just in time and those things might still apply. It's just that in a different way by the way you are using technology and so on. Two of you? So I would say that there was a time, I remember for me, you know, I've always worked in big companies. SAP was a big company, worked with lots of customers. You know, Blackstone is a very, um, has a very large portfolio. And everybody kind of looked at the speed as the sexy, fun right. places where you wanted to work because they were innovative and doing all the good stuff and they were going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And then the big companies mm -hmm. that have been around forever were kind of the dinosaurs. I think technology has changed that a lot, right? So you think about, there's not one business in any industry out there that is not also a technology company today. And if they're not, then they're at risk for disruption. So I think technology has helped a lot of these larger scale companies redefine and reshape themselves in new ways. Mm -hmm. Number one, I think that you, you, just because you're fast, if you're not profitable, right. then how are you investing in things like resiliency or right. manufacturing right. or your customers, as an example? Um, I think also in today's age, you know, scale gives you, it gives you unique um, ability to see things that others can't see, right? You can kind of see the forest through the trees. If you have a big customer base, right, you can see a lot of what's happening. You can move faster. What kind of products do you want to develop? Um, it allows you to have diversity of customers, so you're not dependent mm -hmm. on any one customer. Um, employees want to know that where they're working is stable and it's going to be there in the of long course. run. So scale matters. <clears throat> scale continues to matter. Scale, it's so still in style. It's going to be the trade-off is not on, over yet. Yeah, it depends on the, the business. What does the business do, the quality of the yeah. business? Yeah. No, I like that. I like that a lot. So I, I do want to kind of confirm what you're saying. Like, Please. Thank uh, you, Amit. Jen, because when we are one of the big organizations, we've got 60,000 engineers across the world. What we're seeing right now is the ability to move innovation from the east to the west, from the west to the east faster than ever before. It used to be a lot more difficult to have that connectivity globally, but with technology, with uh, how much investment we did with offshoring, it's now allowing us to create innovation hubs in every part of the world that gets visibility of all the work we do with all our clients and then connect the dots in a way that we've never done before. Mm -hmm. Add to that data analytics and technology, it's become much better. Talking of data analytics and technology, you know, in universities we are developing this uh, paranoia, for a lack of a better word, that chat GPT is going to replace us as faculty. So, you know, but we are battling that strongly. So how is that, how is that affecting your life? I mean, generative AI, now you have, uh, we don't need us, they don't need us anymore, you have a fantastic, so tell us a little bit of how is that affecting your well, I, I think that uh, chat GPT still hallucinates more than most professors. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Keep saying that. Thank you. Thank you. We need more so of that. So yeah. chat GPT has a ways to go, um, <laughs> on, in my opinion. I mean, if you rely on it, good luck, because everybody's CV that I've ever asked. Thank you. Thank Google you. yourself and see what comes up. Um, can, can we quote you on that? Because, you know, for the university, it's important. Absolutely. And um, <laughs> the, the, But where I do think that the AI is... is um, uh, coming much more into its own is actually um, has to do with markets in the very short term. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have bidding engines. We, we invented lithium ion batteries for energy storage. Uh, but a big part of that, it, it does, it, it's, you know, bidding in, in seconds into a market, buying and selling electricity, charging and discharging. And so, in things like that, it's, it's really where it excels. Now, they are 
um, you know, real economies of scale, because if you are first and you're biggest, you have more data, and therefore you're harder to beat. Okay. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're in first, you can create significant market power there. So that, that is being incorporated into a lot of the technical management of systems. I see it there much more than uh, into the, the people aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I expect this to get much, much better over time. So, you know, things like you know, law clerks and things like that, I think will eventually be replaced. But you definitely seriously need a uh, AI which is less, um, hallucinates less, and you can actually rely on the data. And plus there's the fact, the other problem is that if you start using it at the company, your data becomes public as well. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not there yet, you know, it, it's coming. And some of this is perverse though. I mean, on any given day, 90 to 70% of the trades on Wall Street or bots. Wow. And so they'll, they'll determine how you did that day. Um, a lot of the, some of these funds, and you'll know this better than me, have holdings that are nanoseconds. They'll hold your stock for a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very thoughtful, you know, thinking about the long-term uh, trade. And the problem that, that I've seen with this is that it, they're very, very fast, but they're very superficial. Interesting. No, and uh, so, you know, longer term, human beings will determine the value of your stock. But on any daily trade, think about this. So what I'm worried is with the advancements in generative AI, I think there'll be less and less human involvement mm -hmm. in, in stock markets, at least for a certain time period. And that, that really is just increasing volatility. Mm -hmm. um, and as an economist, you, you'll remember, we actually wanted to put, uh, what do they call it? It was, it was sand in the wheels of, you know, sort of high speed trading because it's hard to come up with a societal advantage to it. You know, they'll tell you, oh, it creates liquidity, mm -hmm. but it's really not true. <clears throat> uh, so, so the fact is that th those are some of the good things and some of the bad things. Um, but, you know, this is not a science, but I think in science, it could be fantastic, the, the things that we learn from, from AI. Great, thank you. Jen? So I've spent, I spent my whole career really as an operator. And, uh, and I used to work at SAP, as you mentioned. And, um, and so you're always, <coughs> you develop new product based on what you're seeing in your, in your customer base. You're out there talking to businesses and you're understanding what are their challenges, opportunities, and you build around that. Um, and so coming into Blackstone, as I spend a lot of time with all of our CEOs out there, and there's so much you know, <laughs> hype right now on, um, on generative AI, what's happening out there, you know, a lot of fear of missing out, FOMO happening. Um, what, what I believe is, you know, not everything is about, okay, what's the rocket ship and how is this gonna completely, you know, change the world tomorrow? It's, what, what we hear from talking to our CEOs is, um, number one, CEOs, they learn from each other. I learn more um, from myself, this is just a piece of unsolicited advice. You're gonna learn a lot, probably more outside the four walls of the company you work in than you will in the company you That's work good. in. That's what makes you valuable to the company that you work in, is you have context of what's going on mm -hmm. around you. And so I always learned a lot from working with other CEOs. And so as we worked with our CEOs, we found um, they wanted two things. One is help us understand what this technology can do right now. And more importantly, how can I start using it today? And so what we saw is three very simple examples, because part of this is just getting started, right? Like helping these businesses get started and mm -hmm. removing the friction. So one area, we have a, a large data science team at Blackstone that spends a lot of time with our um, companies are quite differentiating for us. We see an opportunity in processes around sales and marketing. How can you take all this data you have around your leads and make sure that your people are focused on the ones that matter, that therefore are gonna have a higher conversion rate into revenue. Mm -hmm. So revenue, number one. Great. Number two is process efficiency. What are, what are just processes that are necessary mm -hmm but they're not high value add, but they take a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? And how can you use process efficiency as a way to use AI to go ahead and deal with that and then repurpose those folks into doing something more valuable. And then the third is knowledge workers, knowledge management, right? Lots of companies have a lot of data. There's disruption risk if you're not figuring out how you figure out how you use that data to become more valuable, use AI mm -hmm. to use that. So those are three scenarios and that what we find is when you just very simply share how businesses, right, as a CEO, mm -hmm. if you learn something, and many times it's in an industry you're not in, sure. right, when you learn what others are doing, it unlocks your own intuition, right? So that's the journey we're on right now, is getting started, removing the friction, and starting to see where these technologies can take us. Thank you. Amar? So 
So uh, completely aligned with the three, and that's how mm -hmm. actually we're focused on our AI oh, strategy. That's so good. that's great to hear. Uh, we've also kind of wanted to make sure we have early quick wins in, in AI, but also make sure we protect our data yeah. and protect our, our IP. So we're, we're pretty much setting uh, a methodology to uh, protect the data, but also come up with quick solutions to our clients. So if I give an example of applicable AI that we're using now, in the water sector, which is one of our biggest markets, we've, we've recognized there's a lack of uh, water treatment plant operators. And these individuals spend a lot of their time going through operating manuals, yeah. uh, reading their operating manuals. We've decided to digitize the operating ma manual and create a generative AI that is uh, fine-tuned away from hallucination that can give <laughs> these uh, operators some really valuable insights on how to operate their plants day to day and also start looking at data from outside their normal data access look at weather data look at uh, events that are happening in their city like ncaa having their final four tournament in the city how does that affect your wastewater system how does that affect your water treatment plant and how should you adjust to it that's an actual applicable ai that a we we have a really well prompt guide for them to to the operators to use and then it never gives the final decision it gives a recommendation that's usually 60 70 percent in the right direction then you still need that human interface to make it work as an example that's good i ha we're running out of time but i really want to ask this question we have a, a new type of risks i mean things that we have the, the two panels we have heard of that i mean the geopolitical cyber financial so just quickly tell me how you when you evaluate risk today how's that been changing the scenario planning relative to the way it was before i mean i like what joe said before well you know we have seen this before only the last couple of years has been different but in the past we used to do this now in your world is uh the new geopolitical cybersecurity all this changing the way you evaluate risk sure um it's funny my, my most of my career we've been always doing um scenario planning uh -huh. So, you know, you take a country and say, if this party wins and they pass this law and you follow it out. And interesting cases when we did it in Venezuela, we always ended up with us, us being nationalized. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted it, but it's actually the result. And that's what happened at the end. So it was actually made, increased my confidence. What's happening nowadays, I'd say that when we do these exercises, is that one, there's more technological uncertainty uh -huh. than there was before. Th things are happening faster. I'm optimistic for where we'll end up, uh, but you know there's still uncertainty. Like, what what is going to be the winning technology yeah, in certain you areas that you don't know? The other thing that's really changed, honestly, is that now the U.S. is probably our biggest political risk. And and you know seriously, you know what keeps you at night? It's like Millet winning in Argentina. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> you know he'll get a haircut. You know whatever. It's, it's not going to make as big a difference. I mean, but in the states. Uh, it's being such, the States is incredibly dynamic. And in these new technologies is really leading more, I think, than, than, than people um, perceive. But, you know, the fact that the political risk is, is just so enormous. That's good. So if you have, you know, the Inflation Thank Reduction you. Act. Thank you. Uh, if, are you going to reverse that in four years? You have trillions of dollars being invested. And to make the change towards a clean economy takes a lead time. So we have, for example, the first large green hydrogen project in the US. It's in Texas, you know, so everything's big in Texas. It's a $4 billion project. $4 billion can supply 0.1% of the US long haul trucking fleet. Wow. Okay, so realize how much is going to have to be invested in the sector to make a meaningful change. All right, well, you know, what happens if they suddenly say, yeah, we we're just kidding about the, you know, the IRA, you know, Trump's going to reverse this. You have a trifecta in Congress. That's a real risk. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, that's I say what's changed. For one, technology is moving much faster. Second, the United States has become much more volatile than it ever was in the past. And unfortunately, because the States used to be, you know, Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola, you know, is, is moving in a certain band. It now, now it's 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 really uh, could be in certain aspects of it outside the bands. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll 
when we think about risk, and I think Joe framed it nicely earlier in the panel, um, we tend to focus on preventing risks, obviously, right? It's how do we prevent risks, you know, whether it be cyber or, or other risks. But what, what we've found is that many companies don't do a good enough job on recovery plans, right? Uh -huh. So when that cyber event happens, and it will, it's amazing how people, like literally some of the simplest things, like who, like if it's on a Sunday at, you know, 11 o'clock at night, like who, who's calling, like how does yeah, that yeah, yeah, happen, yeah. right? Take Silicon Valley Bank and the runoff that happened last spring. Mm -hmm. That was like something we had never seen, unprecedented speed made possible through social media. And this was something that I think had a, a massive impact and ripple impact that many people in finance didn't, you know, in, the, in these departments and companies, it's like, what's the ripple impact to my customers? Are they gonna be able to pay me? My suppliers, wow. mm -hmm. what's gonna happen here? Like, do I have the phone numbers and the account numbers to basic recovery of thinking about that? Yeah, so that's, that's a big focus area that's that we, very, that we very clear. Address. You know, the recovery plan is good. I, I wonder, you know, to what extent some companies want to leverage on the risk, you know, that they really enjoy and they make money out of that risk because they say, I'm very prepared mm -hmm. than others, but we'll see. I'd, I'd say COVID's kind of taught us something around risk that some, there's a lot you can't predict and you really need to set up an organization that's agile, fast in action, that can move and, and adjust on a regular basis. So, so we now kind of evaluate the risks at a much uh, shorter frequency uh -huh. and then make sure that we have enough agility in the organization to react to it. And, you know, COVID's proven that we can do that really efficiently. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. and it is actually beneficial when you do it right. So, so that's a key yeah. part of that. Fantastic. Now, I cannot, I'm going to let them ask questions. But before that, being a university, we cannot let you go uh, before asking some final words of wisdom for our students <laughs> in light of these changing times. Look at them. This is the future. You should, so, you know, whatever you're going to say, think hard and deep. Optimism is the most important <laughs> thing. This is the future of the world, you know. We have been around for almost 300 years, and we expect to be at Georgetown for another 3,000 years. So feel the pressure on your shoulders yeah. to give them words of wisdom. I mean, look, I, I, I think we're entering a, an era of you really see science and learning accelerating. So it, it's an interesting time uh, because I, I think that the, our capacity to, to invent and to make things is, is growing exponentially. The only words of wisdom I would say is that, you know, you're going to have to be constantly learning because it, it's, you know, what you knew five years ago may not be that relevant today. Okay. And, and I just wanted to build on something you said like that, that Eisenhower said that, uh, you know, when you enter a battle, your plan is worthless. But planning is, you know, essential. Yeah. So, you know, running through these mental exercises and, and doing desktop planning is so important because reality, the reality that hits you is not going to be what you model, but you'll have a basis and a mental framework for how to react to it. And so that if, you, if we're going into a more uncertain future, that, that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jan? You all are here to learn here at Georgetown. But the reality is, is the more senior and advanced in your career that you go, you will have to become even more learners. And go. surround yourself with people Thank who you. are very different from you. And then the one thing I've learned, and this just took many, many years, nothing is ever as good as it seems, and nothing's ever as bad as it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like that. That was good. Our? My last one is be agile and be willing to pivot. It's going to happen a lot in your careers. And you should learn how to enjoy change and embrace change. That's good. You see, I love finishing with that. <laughs> we have time, I think. We have time for one question. Question, anybody? Yes, go ahead. I mean, run to this because they are telling me cut it out. So if you carry <laughs> out, then you might Got a big sign over here. two questions in one. You want me to start? Yeah. I got it. 
So, so I, I'm going to reemphasize. There's going to be a for a while uh, uh, where AI is hallucinating, but once it gets there, it still is going to need a prompter, somebody that understands the science and components of things and asks the right questions for AI to address. And then it'll never give you a 100% answer. So being able to take something that's done 60 70% and conclude it, that skill is important, plus communications, communications, communications. Excellent. Thank you. Next question quickly. Oh, you go ahead. Andres, Jan? No? OK. Um, hi, thank you. I'm an MBA student and also a co-founder of EV Charging Stop. So one of the things that concerns the EV charging industry, is the amount of electricity needed to power a massive adaption of yeah. EVs in the short future. So Mr. Gruski, from your perspective, do you foresee a massive aggressive electrification in the transport in the short to midterm future? And what are the things the industry is doing to mitigate the power yeah. supply bottleneck? Yeah, this is great. This morning, I was actually at the, um, the Edison Electric Institute's international conference. <laughs> wow. So you had the CEOs from Japan, from Europe, from Australia, from Canada. We were all talking. That's one of the issues that came up. So we'll probably need to like triple ca electric capacity over, over the next 20 years. And that's why I said there's just not enough stuff. There's not enough minerals to do it the same way. Um, so I think there, there will be some bumps on the road in that electrification. Um, but I, I think that it's coming. I think that um, you know, if there were a carbon tax, it would come now. But, but just from the fact that you know, our cities would be so much more pleasant with all electric vehicles, think about the lack of noise, think about the lack of pollution. It, it will change many things. So um, you know, we're investing billions. I, I, one of the things that does worry me is that a lot of the laws and regulations are like for today's technologies. They're not thinking about tomorrow. Um, and I've, I've experienced it with some things that we've come up with. They can do things that weren't contemplated in the laws written 20 years ago. So I, I don't believe the easy graphs that go asymptotic. And you know, so if, if we're planning to double or triple, you know, maybe it'll be one and a half times too. Uh, the other thing is that the, the um, efficiency in use is, is very, very important. And, and so there, there'll be a lot of more systems that are going to be put in place. We can take it offline, but it's a fascinating subject. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking this magnificent group of panelists. Thank you, guys.